Hey everybody, welcome to The Curse Trials, presented to you by Team Archon. My name is Frodan, and today I'm joined by Kriparian to bring Hello, you guys man. a pretty unique format once again, uh, brought by the Archon guys, and it's really exciting to see what's going to be happening because we're going to bring something pretty new to the table. Crip, uh, how's it going? And let's explain a little bit about what this tournament's all about. That's going pretty good. Thank you, Frodan. So uh, what Archon's put on for you guys is like a bit of a teaser. You know, Blizzard has announced the standard and the wild format separation coming up soon, PM. And, um, you know, Archon wanted to, to take a little bit of a spin on this type of idea. We wanted to see what the standard format, which will become the standard type of tournament format and from, from now on in Hearthstone, I want to see what that might be like. Now, it's going to be skewed a little bit because, uh, you know, there are, there's going to be a big expansion that's going to come with the introduction of the standard format. will probably dictate a lot of the decks, a lot of what people will play. But the exclusion of Naxxramas and GVG will take place once this new expansion comes into the scene. And, uh, you know, we can have a little bit, little bit of fun time being take that expansion those two expansions out and see what players can come up with in the tournament format when 30,000 bucks is on the line so you know should be some pretty crazy stuff but I do want to remind you guys that you know Blizzard also announced that they will be making a lot of changes so that the base set doesn't conflict with you know power level of cards that they would like to introduce in future expansions. So, you know, anything that might seem really broken today has a really good chance of not being all that broken uh, after the next round of cards. That's right. It could be seen as a, a direct presentation of what's on the chopping block. A lot of people are putting some cards under fire. I mean, a lot of people are looking at Druid as one of those classes, for example. Uh, but we'll talk more about that. Uh, as we see more cards and what deck choices people bring. We also want to walk through about how the tournament is going to proceed. We're going to be playing in two separate groups of eight players each. Uh, within those two groups, we're going to be playing double elimination over the span of three days. So if you're watching this on VOD and you, caught, you missed the first day, don't worry. We're going to be broadcasting over three days with a lot of great players. Our first group today is Group A. We have four matches for the winner's bracket, and then we're going to continue to advance through the double elimination portion. We're going to start things off with Trump versus Eloise, and then we're going to follow it up with Amnesiac versus Tice, Forsen versus Brian Kibler, and then Strifeco versus Orange. And then on Group B, we're going to have RDU versus Firebat, Savitz versus Kalento, Oskaka, the world champion, versus Super JJ, and Life Coach versus Zelay. Pretty cool talents pool, I think. I, I think we have a really good mix of strong players, good deck builders, and some prominent personalities here, Crip. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the tournament, the idea was we wanted to have the players who are somewhat experienced uh, in, in the scene, making their own decks, making the name for themselves, kind of highlight what this type of format might be like. And, uh, you know, what would it be like? Well, we have seen a lot of Druid players. Um, we got a quick look at some, of the, at some of the classes, and Druid is absolutely the most popular one. But with any very popular deck in any one scene. You're going to have players trying to counter it. You're going to have, at the very least, players trying to tech around it. So, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see this very uncontrolled meta uh, tournament because usually these type of changes, these type of uh, small inclusion of tech cards requires a lot of iteration, requires a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to practice this type of format when you know, you're probably the only one of your group of friends participating in it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and, and now that you see such a big pool of cards eliminated, because Nax Ramus and GVG have been a staple crux in which the entire game of Hearthstone has been balanced around. I mean, yeah. you have to take into account that a lot of Black Rock Mountain, TGT, League of Explorers, the reason why the cards printed the way they did was because Nax Ramus and GVG already existed, Therefore, it destabilizes a lot of existing decks. Uh, and so the first instinct for a lot of these players is what cards or what decks are impacted the least. And that's why they look at classes like Druid, where I think they only played Pilot Shredder. And that was probably the only, maybe Shade and X-Ramus as well. That's probably like one of the, the yeah. most common things that you can see. But shade, shade is one of those cards that you could just, you know, sub out and put whatever you want in there. Um, Druid is absolutely one of those classes that, you know, moving forward had a few issues where, you know, Blizzard wants to make some really cool cards, some, you know, 
some cool inclusions and future expansions, and they have to always compete with the with the base set, uh, which is the, the classic set and the basic set. You know, these two sets will always be part of the standard format, and if those cards are just you know on a higher power level. Blizzard has to either just make cards that are worse that never really see play, or they're mm -hmm. going to have to make better cards, which has, you know, other issues, as we've seen in the past. And, um, you know, kind of your take on, on this whole uh, expansion situation is, is pretty interesting. I think I would say that TGT has not really taken into account a lot of the other sets, uh, which is why not that many of the cards have seen too much play recently. But I see that as a huge plus when it comes to the future of the standard format because uh, most of the really powerful cards in the game are actually in the GVG and the um, the next Ramus sets. So with those moving out, if you wish to play standard in the future, it'll be an easier environment to control. There's very few outlier yeah. cards that really just seem completely insane. You know. These days, if you play ranked, even if you play arena, you're going to encounter so many situations where it's, you know, it's that one drop from Nax Ramus, it's that two drop from, you know, GVG, it's that muster for battle. It's like, how do I deal with this? So many of those crazy early game cards are moving out, and I think it's going to allow for a lot of hidden gems to start shining. At the same time, though, you have to wonder what kind of holes are created by the absence of it. So people look at Paladin as being a very problematic class mm -hmm. currently in the metagame of both Arena and Constructed. Um, and now with a lot of its early game out, I mean, it can't even really build defensive because Zombie Chow is eliminated. It was on the list of notable cards. So even the mid-range Paladin, not necessarily the secret Paladin that people are looking at, uh, does suffer a lot as well. Um, does that mean Paladin is just unplayable in this format? Quite possibly. I mean, depends on what kind of builds you want to do. People are looking at Murloc Paladin still being able to survive despite not having the Antique Heal Bot and the Sludge Belcher, but... Uh, the classes that I expect to see the most are actually represented right there on your screen. We have Trump versus Eloise coming up, uh, Druid, Shaman, Warlock, uh, and Warrior actually doesn't lose that much. And the the, the, really? fourth, the fifth class that I was going to expect to see as well is Hunter, but you know maybe maybe that's going to be um, like a, a niche pick because people feel like these classes are much more dominant. Mm -hmm. I, I disagree with you a little bit. I think Warrior actually loses a lot, and I'm kind of curious what your take on Warrior is after. Uh, after GVG and Nex Ramus have to be excluded? Uh, well, this, this is something that uh, I, I think might be a little bit popular, but I like, or that might not be popular, but I think Dragon decks are actually still very good, despite mm -hmm. the fact that GVG and Nex Ramus have came out. And a lot of people are looking at Deathbite being eliminated from Warrior, but if you look at Control Warrior specifically, it's one of the most adaptable control decks in any metagame. Even if you lose Deathbite, which is seemingly a very core card, if you decide to play, I don't know, say Dragon Warrior, I think it's a very strong archetype still, like in, in terms of being control. Um, and you still have a lot of options as well, because in the end, you just kind of mix and match legendaries or big cards that impact whatever metagame you think it is. So if you are expecting a very big aggro meta, uh, which it feels like it leans towards, because without heals and taunts like Belcher and Healbot and Chow, uh, I, I'm leaning towards seeing some of that as well. So... If I look at what's the strongest uh, dragon decks, I think priest and probably warrior. So, uh, but at the mm -hmm. same time, um, maybe it's not a popular pick. Maybe it's just a, a deck that's out there and it's not as strong as, uh, say, you know, shaman, which only loses crackle. Well, going into our first match, uh, I have seen that Trump has done like the full analysis on, you know, what all the popular decks are, what cards they're losing, and kind of, you know. Moving forward, what can we expect? So I know he's done a lot of this analytical research, and I feel that, um, you know, I think no player is going to have, like, the perfect deck list for this tournament because they haven't really been able to practice it adequately as you would for any other tournament. But I do kind of have my faith in Trump bringing the correct classes. I don't know if that makes much sense. So I, I, I think through through just looking at every single available deck out of what we had now, taking the cards out from Nexramus from GVG. I think w with what's left, he's playing the most complete decks. So that's why we see here the, the Aggro Shaman. Aggro Shaman is very much like Druid, one of, those, uh, one of those classes that loses almost nothing with the exclusion of those two sets. Oh, all right. So we're already starting to see the beginnings of how it's formulating. Like we said, Aggro Shaman still exists. 
very much intact. They lose Crackle as one of their burst options, but they can just play a little bit more board centric or even just use more chargers. That's always an option as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're hopping on Trump's POV. He is the Shaman player, and he's going to start things off with Sir Fiddly, looking for opportunities to get the burn in, but he doesn't get the, the most obvious one. There's no Hunter Hero power. There's no Druid one. It's not even Life Tap. Uh, and he said he chooses the Reinforce Hero power, which just seems to be a solid pick. You agree? It's a pretty solid pick. Um, I feel like the Reinforce Hero power does better than the, the regular Shaman Hero power, so I think this is uh, a step up nonetheless. But the, the Shaman Hero Power pumping up, uh, you know, RNG, Stone Claw Totems, turn after turn after turn after turn against Warrior is one of the most frustrating <laughs> things when the Warrior can't use its weapons to actually remove the, th the threats that it needs to. So I think overall this is, this is a plus, but, uh, you know, some of the turns are not going to play out quite as well because of the lack of those taunts. Yeah, um, that's a really good point because the, the warrior can definitely destroy aggro by, in the very early game, using these weapons to remove a lot of the minions. And outside of the very early game, the shaman deck doesn't really want to be playing minions past turn four or five. That's not going to change when the the very core cards of GVG and Axe Ramus rotate out. Uh, they're still going to want turns four to five to be playing burn, doom hammer into a uh, uh, more burn. And hopefully drawing to those right card combinations. So uh, Eloise being able to remove the board this early on is pretty big. She prioritizes removing the Leper Gnome here. Um, and Trump, instead of feeding more into the War Axe with his Knife Juggler or Abusive Sergeant, chooses the Hero Power and play a little bit slow. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it. I think the Knife Juggler is much more valuable. Um, you're, you're very frequently facing this situation when you're in like a, an arena environment um, where your opponent has like a weapon and you can play into it, but you know you're going to run out of cards before you kill him. So yeah, at the same time, you know that your opponent, even with a good weapon, is going to make desperate plays. So I think, um, I think there's a decent chance that uh, Eloise will still kill something with her War Axe this turn, even though it doesn't seem like she needs to. There we go. Yeah, there it is. And you know, Fierce Monkey, a card that's flown still like under the radar a lot. I know a few players did like it. Life Coach, for example, really liked the Fierce Monkey Warrior and even brought it to big premier tournaments. What, what's your opinion on the card? Do you think it got a lot better because we don't have as reliable taunts as we used to? Oh, it's a lot better in the standard format because we don't have minions that have to die three times. Um, it just, just you know, it's it's kind of like the, the the boxer card. Like he's he's got everything that you really need, and he just doesn't do so well against those like cheater minions that you have to kill three times. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got you. Know. <laughs> but uh, it, in like a fair battle, the monkey is is quite fierce. Oh, oh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, I actually really like the, the monkey card, too, because it has many funny translations across languages. Plus, it has some of the best voice acting, which is a pretty underrated facet of Hearthstone. Yeah. Uh, Trump's going to go ahead and try to just load up the board once again. He's got some okay tool kit tools right now to like make a, mm -hmm. a small kit for pushing aggro. But still, if you can just stabilize... Ooh, Eloise doesn't get any dragon synergies, though, with the Blackwing Corruptor. That's pretty. One that's turn, sometimes pretty unfortunate. One turn earlier, Trump used the the rock biter instead of the fifty fifty chance on the abusive, and I feel like those are indicators that Trump still feels like he's in an even or somewhat comfortable position to win this game. Usually, if you're you know completely out of the game, you would take risks like that. So even though Trump doesn't seem to be doing all that well in terms of the aggro game here, um, it it appears that he is still in a comfortable spot. Yeah, I would agree, because now that he hit more draw, like, it, it's one of those th scenarios as well, as you look at Warrior being at 26 health, and there's an armor smith out, but if the board is not really dealt with, and if Trump picks up very efficient ways to remove the board, and Eloise still doesn't draw a dragon with her dragon warrior deck, it's one of those things that it just continues to snowball, and, and the damage from the board gets very strong, because it's repetitive damage over and over. Uh, the juggle here, unfortunately, not going the way I think Trump wanted initially. He wanted a very clean removal of the Armorsmith first, and then now has to pick and choose how he wants to go about this of killing the Armorsmith. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you have to, dude. Use you, a reinforce to just go for the juggle? Yeah. I really is it feel like... Is shock is too valuable otherwise? Mm-hmm. Well, it looks like he's just going to use it. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about it because 
if the if the juggle lands on even the face or the two two, it felt like it was in a really awkward and bad spot. Oh, that's so interesting, King's Defender. I was not expecting this card either. Who needs death spice when you can just <laughs> King's Defender? It sure beats Ogre War Mall, that's for sure. Well, actually, with good RNG, it doesn't. Ah, well, okay, okay, okay. How about, <laughs> that is true, but when you're playing things like Fierce Monkey, that extra charge could be pretty huge as well. That's true, that's true. Um, you know, we're so used to, like, the two durability weapons when it comes to board control that having that third durability, it's, it's like you don't know what to do, really. Um, it, the wep the, a weapon with three durability is so much more frustrating to play against. Still no dragon, but he's got to make the play here. Or she's got to make the play. No worries, I knew exactly what you meant. Um, you know, in in this scenario, too, it's, even though, like you said, there's no value in the battle cry effect, you still just need to play a minion. And it's one of those things, too, where, you know, Warrior's going to pretty soon be able to flip the switch. I mean, Gromash is a legitimate threat if you end up using it as removal. Um, or if she picks up a legitimate dragon to start comboing stuff. No, I think you have to go Gromash right now. Let's see, two Overlord, so in the worst case scenario, and you often look at Doomhammer being that case, then that's still 12 damage. You're, you're at 20, that's still okay, and you even have Bash to climb back in it. I mean, is this the point where Eloise even starts turning the game around and maybe no, putting Trump on the clock? Doesn't look like it, doesn't look like it. That's a lot of damage. All right, so we're overloaded for two. We need six next turn, so we can overload two more. Is that going to work? If we do seven, it would be a total of. Uh... No, it looks it looks like it won't be. I wonder. Trump does yeah. not have a two turn lethal here, even if even if Eloise gains no armor next turn. Right. So it this is a very does complicate it too. Hmm. So then, do you play the removal game? I mean, you, it's not like exactly this. This is exactly why something like having a hero power, which adds more damage immediately might be the difference maker of pushing you over the edge because that Paladin hero power doesn't translate into a lot of impact at the moment. I think what you have to do is just lightning bolt the 5-2, play a dude, and go face. <laughs> yeah, and then pray that your opponent doesn't have like some way to directly clear, but I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like At this stage, I wonder if Eloise even put more anti-aggro tools like Revenge in her deck. It might realistically be, because Dragon Warrior he just wants to continue to control mm -hmm. and use high-impact minions. Revenge is a very powerful card, um, especially against unsuspecting players. Uh, once players start playing around it, it suddenly becomes terrible. But in this type of format, I think with so many things up in the air and so few actual known answers to things, it is, it is the perfect card to include in your deck. Mm. It would be pretty cool in inclusion. Uh, Ellie is also in an interesting spot here because if she attacks face with Gromash because she wants to start putting the Shaman on the clock, I believe she'll be uh, one damage off lethal the following turn because Azure Drake and Bash is a total of uh, four damage on top of the 15. So that would put the Shaman at one HP. So, you know, if she wants to use Bash now versus just hero power and take it a little bit slower, the, the reason why you can use Bash is because you're anticipating picking up something else to play with your mana, so you're trying to be as mana efficient as possible. Well, I like this play. Um, looks like uh, Trump's got to go Doomhammer in here. But, you know, the nice thing is that for Camp Eloise, uh, the Rock Fighter number two has been used already, so that's one thing that you don't have to respect, so to speak, um, unless there's some weird random thing to give plus attack that I'm not thinking of. Well, right now, Eloise is actually dead, unless she draws away to give more than the two uh, armor that she can from her hero power. Yep. Trump's got it. Uh, there's, there's no way Eloise can seal out the game. Um, I don't think there's any zero drop of the Azure Drake. Oh, yeah, there's... Could have been a target dummy, right? Oh, no, that's GVG! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just a little bit short of the damage. And again, it's like all these little small things do end up mattering. Once again, though, the uh, the Shaman just barely able to edge out the game. And that, like, that's a pretty big deal. Like, being able to just shut down this Dragon Warrior and get the aggro Shaman out of the way. Because when you anticipate your opponent's... Uh, like lineup, you just want to get as much of an edge as possible. So just by the hair of his chinny chin chin, Trump takes game number one over Eloise. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, often in, in the regular Conquest format, you know, when you lose a game with a deck and you have to play it again, it's not really too big of a deal. Uh, it sometimes can actually lead into you cornering out like a specific deck or something like that. But in this environment where so few things are known, you know, you, you don't know what's in their deck. You don't know what their tech cards are. You don't know what kind of surprise cards they have. Any deck that loses is going to have a much harder time actually winning the second game because every, every Every deck in this whole tournament has that surprise factor that that makes it what it is. Um, and with with the surprise factor gone, you, you, you have that ingredient missing. Um, so uh, I feel like, as opposed to regular Your tournaments with regular conquest formats, in in this one, um, you actually get punished a lot for losing early on. Because like you know, Trump mm. knows that Eloise is playing uh, Dragon Warrior knows some of the cards in it, knows what to play around, knows all this stuff the next time going into it. And the next time going into it is right now. Looks like it's going to be Dragon Warrior against uh, some form of Zoo Lock. Yeah, it's like classic Zoo from back in the beta days. You don't have access to a lot of convenient cards like Haunted Creeper, Nerubian Egg, um, Implosion. Those are some really big cards that can swing the board tempo. Uh, and really start to build dominant board position. Yeah, but, you know, you still have some pretty good cards that, uh, from, you know, like in Gang Boss being one of them, Dark Peddler being another one from League of Explorers. So it doesn't feel like they lose too, too much. Oh, big time draw. Once again, Fiery War X right on the top of her deck on turn two. And I like the observation that you made, uh, Crip, about the more that uh, Trump knows about the deck, the, the better he's equipped to mulligan correctly and be, uh, be very good against it. But... Uh, I mean, right now, it's looking like even though Trump had has this information, it's just his curve is so strong that I don't think he even necessarily needed it. The zoo's just mm -hmm. going to play very linearly. Like, I just want to build a very dynamic and strong board. But the nice thing is if Eloise has a brawl, it's like when you brawl as a warrior, sometimes three or four minions come out of it, even though you're trying to clear everything but one minion. Well, the reason that you'd play a brawl is just because um, you'd have to kill minions so many times. Uh, you'd often have to like attack a minion with death rattle and then brawl or you know the opposite way around. So I feel that with with most powerful death rattle minions going out uh, in in the future standard block, that brawl might not be as required. Um, you can probably get away with other form of board clears. I think something like Baron Geddon to be even stronger. Um, I actually I actually play revenge in some of my. Uh, cheaper uh, control warrior creations and uh, it, it does seem to work pretty well um, hmm. the, the, the the 12 uh, HP margin seems to get zero respect from what I've seen on ladder yeah I, I know what you mean too just because people are playing around like the death spite whirlwind they're playing around sometimes even directly whirlwind itself but revenge is the three damage AoE is so such a big deal because warrior a lot of their quality of their minions can survive that revenge, but a lot of the opponent's aggro can. Mm -hmm. Interesting here move by Trump. Looks like he wanted to trade the Divine Shield, which is really powerful against Warrior. Um, oh no, yeah, he actually he didn't just trade. Face. Looks like he was going to, but um, I think I think there's a case for both. But um, Trump has shown a lot of confidence in his zoo game so far. But I still feel like going face is, is a little bit better. I think you, you, you generally have more options when you put a warrior on lower HP. You also have to keep in mind that, um, oh, there is the brawl there. Uh, and it is usable with, with the coin, but I, I don't know. I feel like there's going to be a better play. But um, yeah, I feel like doing damage to a warrior's face, you got to take like the arena strategy here. Um, the main the main strength of a warrior is he has so efficient and such tempo removal with weapons, and the more face damage that you do, the less of that you have to play around. Um, and with with warrior with this deck featuring the three durability weapon uh, with the king's defender rather than a death bite means you know more and more hits that the warrior has to take on face. Yeah, also a good point too. Ellie's going to remove uh, the 2-2 two -two here, and looks like it's just going to bash as well to remove. Even bashing the Imp Gang boss and creating a couple of extra token imps so that the board is loaded up with more 1-1s. One -ones. I guess in, in anticipation of potentially more minions playing the board, she can brawl next turn. Wow. 
Um, I think I like the Dark Iron here. Same damage as the Doggy, and you don't really want to tap when you draw Doom Guard. I think if there was no Doom Guard draw there, uh, the the Dire Wolf plus tap may have been better. Yep, I uh, definitely agree here. There's still no there's still, still no direct need to overextend. Uh, Eloise going for uh, a brawl. There's a 25% chance that Dark Iron survives. This ends up being uh, slightly above average. Yeah. Case here. Still favored for Trump here. And uh, Trump's going to push for another 7 damage. Eloise is on 4 HP. Um, yeah, not looking I don't very see how good. this is going to happen. She doesn't have an activator for the execute. Revenge would be pretty good off the top. We just have to keep in mind that I, I, I feel like while she has a lot of good answers, if she ever falls behind, it's so difficult to come back on the board and gain life in an appropriate way. Um, you know, with Shield Maiden out, with Antique Healbot out, you're so limited on how you bump up your HP after you're, you've actually started the recovery process. And it seems that might be a bit of a weakness. Um, and we see Trump ahead two points to zero. Eloise has only revealed her warrior deck, but, you know, Trump does have that Druid, and we, we talked about it. Druid doesn't really lose really anything. I mean, I, I think anything is the closest way to talk about it. Um, so we, we see a warrior deck that's broken down a little bit against Druid, which is just so powerful. Yeah, uh, Druid is still extremely explosive, just like you said. They don't lose anything for Force of Nature, Savage Roar. The, the, the biggest thing that loses is the Pilot Shredder and Dr. Boom, which have very sticky and very strong board presence with the combo damage. Uh, however, I, I am interested in the variations of Druid. So, for example, if you're anticipating a lot of aggro in this format, again, because you're missing Sludge Belcher and TQ Bot and Zombie Chow, then you're probably more likely to play things like a Darnassus Aspirin, which the more Aspirins you have, the better the Warrior matchup does get, just because it's early game that's easy for Warrior to remove. So, I think uh, I think there's still this like weird floating uh, range, right, where sometimes Warrior can actually be decent against Druid, as long as Druid gets, like, not that great of a start, and Warrior can get off to a very good start. It's not an unwinnable matchup. It's just very tough in the mid stages of the game. You don't even have access to cards like Shield Maiden anymore as Warrior, because that was a GVG card. And right. Shield Maiden is one of the most impactful cards, because it not only gained you life, but it also was a 5 5 body to contest Druid stuff. I think the main problems. Uh, oh, wow, this Darnassus is going to get obliterated by the <laughs> Elastraz's champion if, if it gets played out this way. And you'll you'll yeah. be absolutely right on that sense. But I, I always felt that in the Druid versus Warrior matchup, the Warrior needed either Shield Maidens to bounce over the threshold of Force of Nature, Savage Roar, or Belcher. Belcher was also... You know, the loss of Belcher doesn't really um, affect too many things oh because God. there are other taunts in the game, there are other options. But particularly against Druid, the breakpoints on the HP pool of, of a Belcher stop the combo completely in its tracks. And uh, yeah. I, I think that is a really big loss for Warrior in this matchup. It's, but the Warrior does have a couple other taunts that's not uh, normal, what we are accustomed to seeing. Mm -hmm. The Fierce Monkey, for example, also the Twilight Guardian. The Twilight Guardian is statted just enough to make it for, very annoying for Druid to get past. Uh, six yeah. health is definitely not convenient at all, given their type of removal. And but it can't be played right now. That's the issue. That's true. I mean, you lose two dragon activators, and it doesn't activate itself. Yeah, so, I mean, it seems like the worst play you can make right now. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like Elise just has to trade the board and probably play the other Alistraza's champion. I'd probably keep the monkey. Uh, like alive here and instead of trade this Alex Strauss's charge just because it's just you know you want more damage onto the board in case your opponent uh, plays Drew the Claw or something else and Trump can take it very You have slow. the same amount of damage next turn. That's true, the, the Blackwing Corruptor. But you know, yeah. Trump takes a very slow approach because he doesn't want his Emperor Thorzen to get uh, killed very easily and it's one of those things where I mean if you're uh, if you're Eloise you're just gonna command the board position and Druid's also taking a lot of damage with follow-up charge minions on the warrior side to potentially swing this. I wield the power. Well, the Darnassus does absolutely nothing, just as yeah. <laughs> Uh But it's kind of like what we were saying. Uh, if 
the warrior can take initiative and you know now Eloise is hitting the perfect dragon synergies this is in contrast to game number one where she had almost no dragon synergy until the final moments of the game uh it, it almost certainly doesn't matter at, at a certain threshold it, what druid does because druid is in the same position it's not like it got better at removing the board at all. In fact, it got slightly worse at impacting the board if you take out cards like Dr. Boom. So uh, I'm, I'm still really liking the position that Eloise is in right now. Yeah, she is, she is kind of winning a little bit more and more. It's like she has like an extra stat point over, over Trump's Druid board every turn. Um, so it does absolutely seem that way. We see the swipe draw, which is possible, uh, the spell damage buff off the Azure Drake, but that still doesn't, that's still like <laughs> one spell damage short of what you want. Yeah, uh, because it's a 5-2 it's a swipe, and they're at 6-3 right now, so very inconvenient. Uh, and execute for more tempo, I mean, it depends on uh, what she also draws off the, the Azure Drake, but I can't really imagine any one... I, I guess maybe Shield Slam would be only four damage. No, I, I think I think this game is uh, is basically over. Uh, we also have to keep in mind that with the exit of Doctor Boom, um, at least in in like the one stage past meta, which we're probably what's what we're seeing right now in the tournament, uh, mm -hmm. BGH is probably uh, not going to see any play in this tournament as a result. So. Um, something Ooh, like Gromash is, is going to be such a big problem for the Druid to deal with. That is a pretty interesting observation. I mean, Dr. Boom was one of the most common reasons why you put Big Game Hunter in the deck. And once again, like we keep mentioning, if you're anticipating a lot of aggro decks, or even Druid decks, to be honest, they don't have many targets for Big Game Hunter. So it's pretty valid if you want to excuse me, take out uh, Big Game Hunter and use that extra card for consistency in your deck. Mm -hmm. Completely viable option, I think. Uh, so Eloise here has, well, she picks up the Fierce Monkey so that King's Defender actually gets an extra charge. Pretty convenient draw here, I'd say. Um, Let's go face. Ooh, do you want to go face? I guess so. You're running kind of low on cards, and it doesn't look like you'll be drawn much else soon enough. So, yeah, putting that lethal on the board there definitely seems like a good one. Trump gives Although, some respect to, to the damage push here, plays the Ancient right. of War. That puts him uh, at exactly one oh, HP. That second Ancient of War, though, that could be pretty big. Oh, no, no. Can't do it. Mm. Chad is probably spamming lethal, lethal, lethal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an 11 mana lethal. Yeah. I mean, that's close enough to 9 mana. I'm sure you could pull that off if you're a professional yeah. Hearthstone player. She she just needs to draw Innervate, I think, is the is the key here. Um hmm. Actually I think she just needs to draw Bash. I think she actually has lethal if she draws Bash. The slam oh, execute okay. Bash and then slam. three. Um yeah. And um I wouldn't put it past uh any player to bring uh, a few obscure cards. Um like I don't know. Um, I'm I'm kind of a big fan of the Argent Horse Rider in any deck in this format because it does remove things without Death Rattle and things without Death Rattle don't spawn one ones to kill the Argent Horse Rider, so I, I could I could see that being played in any deck in this format. Uh, I could see Kirkon Elite perhaps being played. Oh. Uh, that's that's cool. a bad card. Yeah, it's just funny because it's like another weapon here that she doesn't need for a while. Uh, yeah. Mm, that's that second ancient of war though that can be backbreaking. Well, how much damage is this? Let's just let's give some credit to the damage here. Uh, each savage drawer is six, so it's six six plus five. That's 20, seventeen 20. plus eight. That's twenty five damage. Trump's gonna have lethal next turn. <laughs> oh, you insane. mean with you mean the ancient of war being played? Yeah, if he, if he plays ancient of war here, Trump is threatening lethal, and Eloise cannot stop it with her current hand. So Eloise has to get lucky with, with the card here. Even though she's she's dominating the game up until last turn in such a big way. Um, Savage Roar does Savage Roar things. Oh, no dragon! Wow. Looks like this is going to be a Trump sweep. <laughs> <laughs> a 3-0. And, and you know that Emperor Thorson being able to hit that second Savage Roar too was really big. Because like say... Um, Say you didn't have that Druid of the Claw, that would have been just the key to ending the game here. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, man, that's pretty. That's pretty unfortunate. You can't really end. You can't really do anything from this position as the warrior because you no. have no activator. And here you get to see directly, like, you know, if if something was like death spite, you know, he Eloise had the chance of hitting face twice with this weapon, which would have been the two damage difference of killing the druid or even having an activator for Gromash. Like, oh, this, death spite would have been spite. straight up lethal last turn because yep. death spite would have. Uh, Combo of execute to kill the last ancient of war, and it would have activated Gromash to do ten face damage. So, uh, Deathbite versus King's Defender was just proven to be absolutely inferior in this game already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the extra charge here didn't matter at all. You know, the third charge not making a big difference. So that's going to wrap it up. Assuming Trump sees the lethal now. You know, I, I completely respect Trump enough, but, you know, he also has proven me wrong a couple of times on this. Yeah. All right, you got it. I mean, well, that is can, lethal. Can damage Savage paper. Roar is, uh, is pretty pretty easy play to make. There it is. So Trump's going to move on in the winner's bracket. And once again, uh, despite having a, a bad start, is able to really rock this Dragon Warrior, which can't really finish it out. And you know what? We kind of brought up, or, you know, I'll take responsibility. I brought up Dragon Dex as uh, one of the things that was kind of mentioned, but, you know, I guess it's just not as consistent. Plus, there's also really weird cards in the deck as well, like the Draconoid Crusher. I wasn't really expecting that at all. Um, um, not really sure. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think, Dra you, you actually swayed me, even though it was absolutely crushed and... Your theory was not proven at all. Um, I think <laughs> I think when standard actually goes through, uh, I do think Dragon Warrior has a lot of those tools, and uh, with some Blizzard intervention on possibly uh, a few cards, uh, I could absolutely see this deck seeing quite a lot of play. So, um, even though it did not get demonstrated, my my faith has been restored to some reasonable degree in the Dragon Warrior. Yeah, well, you know what? Maybe there's hope. Uh, we'll have to see as Blizzard continues to fill the holes, but the biggest hole right now is the one probably in Eloise's heart. She's 0-3 and immediately sent to the loser's bracket. She's not eliminated, but she will be playing that game off stream while we move on. In the meantime, we're going to get ready for our second match of the day. It's Amnesiac from Team Archon, a young 15-year-old prodigy versus Tice, the European regional champion from last year. I want to give a shout out to uh, the Curse Network for being able to support this event and putting it on, as well as Hearthpone. Check out all their cool stuff uh, over at Geek Feel as well, uh, as they are still supporting the event and making this possible. We're going to take a few minutes to get ready for our second match of the day, so don't go anywhere. When we come back, more action here at the Curse Trials. Stay tuned. <laughs> 